There is a world known only to a few, a world open only to the initiated. It's a dangerous, complex, and forbidding world. It is the world of submarines. Few ships are as intriguing or mysterious as the submarine. Seeing it this way is like catching a glimpse of a wild thing on the edge of its domain. Soon this ship will dive and disappear, and for months at a time, she will sail an unseen world. The men on board are as intriguing as the ship they sail. They are members of a fraternity cloaked in mystique, notorious for their silence about where they go and what they do. What is this world like? Why would a man choose to come aboard a ship like this and sail into such an isolated and remote existence? For the first time in 20 years, the United States Navy has allowed a civilian film crew to go along on a submarine patrol. This film is the result. Below decks, in the belly of the beast, the control room, the nerve center of a submarine. The ship's vital systems, helm, periscopes, navigation, weapons, are squeezed into a space about the size of a one-car garage. Here, the submariners seem to rely on a different set of senses. Their perception of the world comes from computer displays geometric projections, and an orientation to their surroundings that's rooted in the imagination. Also, Dick, last man down, hatch secure. Last man down, hatch secure, her or I. Captain, the ship is ready to dive, current sounding, 655 fathom, check for the chart. Question is to the submerged ship. Very well, Officer Deck, submerge the ship. Submerge the ship, aye, sir. Diving officer, submerge the ship. Submerge the ship, aye, sir. Two lots of one MC, dive, dive, two blasts and dive alarm. Dive, dive. On the 1MC, dive, dive. Two blasts on the diving alarm. Dive, dive, right? Dive, dive. Dive. For outsiders, the redundancy of communication might seem like overkill. Three, two. Decks are washed. One would assume that diving the submarine would be routine. Three, four. But no maneuver or operation here can ever be routine. Three, six. A hundred and thirty men are beginning a lonely descent into an environment as foreign and as hostile as outer space. Roger, repeat, you want. Roger, repeat. I set in all main ballasting pins. The ship is as intricate as any spacecraft. All pins are shut, Dad. With the added risk of a nuclear power plant just thirty yards out. Number two scopes under. Lower number two scope. Lower number two scope. Six six. So every communication on board is acknowledged and verified, and verified again, because every action must be conspicuous and conscious. There's no margin for error. Seven eight. 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 Seven the ship has been submerged. The uh, exit of events will be... Throughout the rest of the ship, the sailors not on watch are getting reacquainted with life in a steel tube, 360 feet long and 33 feet wide. Because of the limited space, there's an intimacy here that's unique to the military. The crew is courteous, considerate, gentle for a military outfit. But how else could these men get along for the months they'll spend submerged? There are no days off, no phone calls home, no windows to daydream through. For as long as this patrol lasts, this tube is their world. Submariners can turn any nook into a private retreat. Because when it comes right down to it, the only true private space on a submarine is the space between one's ears. This is where you're going to be sleeping. Your responsibility. You got to take care of it. 
If you don't, I'm going to come and hunt you down. The chief of the boat, the man in charge of all the enlisted men, is showing a new man just how little space he has to call his own. A six by three by two foot cubicle. Pillowcase and a white blanket folds to put the bunk. All your clothes are supposed to fit in this bunk pad that you take with you. There's no stowage anyplace else but there but for your stuff. Okay. Sleeping on a submarine is something of an art form. First you have to get into bed. Step two is getting comfortable. Most of the racks are too short for somebody who's like 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, I had physical two years ago, I was 6'4", and now I'm saying I'm 6'3". So I'm shrinking somewhere. <laughs> You must also learn to sleep with constant activity around your bunk. Ship operations go on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The space is limited because hardware takes priority over human accommodation. Consider that the nuclear propulsion system takes up the back third of the ship. No living quarters in the stern. Just secrets. Our crew could not film. Commander Bruce Lemkin, captain of the Rickover. This is the captain. It's good to be back underway at sea. Underway on time. And uh, we're ahead of schedule right now. Check your spaces, check the stowage. View the procedures. We'll be doing a lot of things including battle stations. Be ready. I hate this. We're uh, exercising the ship at large angles to uh, work on the proficiency of the ship control party as well as to uh, check stowage throughout the ship. Right now we're at a 30 degree down angle. Pretty dramatic as you can see. Maneuvers like this are an essential part of getting the ship ready for patrol. The point is to shake everything loose now rather than later on, when a Rickover might be stalking or eluding an adversary. 3-0 up and sir. Die, make your depth. 200 feet, 3-0 up and Something as simple as a coffee can falling against the hull can be heard for miles underwater. Keeping quiet is critical to avoiding detection. And for a submarine, detection could mean death. The submarine's only advantage over other ships is its stealth. It has no, no armor protection. It has very limited weapons. Uh, it has pretty good speed, but it cannot run a helicopter. Uh, it's, it's a small, vulnerable target if it can be located. Uh, the secrecy that, uh, that is part of the silent service comes simply from the fact that the stealth is the only advantage they have and they must protect it. Officer Deck, Rick Schiffer, Patrol Flyer. Rick Schiffer, Patrol Flyer, aye, sir. Now the Rickover is ready. But ready for what? What is her mission in an age of peaceful coexistence? An age when keeping the peace depends upon convincing adversaries that war is unwinnable. Keep your watch, keep your be quiet. Because what a submarine does, it creates in the mind of the adversary both certainty and uncertainty. He knows what terrible things you can do. That's the certainty of it all. But a terrible uncertainty in his own mind as to where you'll do it and when. Now, the great thing about a submarine is that you can literally defend in depth because you can put submarines way, way out, Lee. maybe quite close to the enemy's doorstep. Professor Lee. Now, you could never do that with surface ships or aeroplanes because they would be provocative, and before you knew it, you'd be at war for real. But submarines can sit out there as far out as you like on the enemy's doorstep, if you really feel that's where they ought to be, without being provocative, I'm instantly ready for war. 
Sonar soup, I have a new contact. Designated Sonar zero room. Zero bearing, zero six eight. On a submerged submarine, there was only one way to sense the outside world. Okay, Sound. It. Contra, I have a new contact. Designated here two zero bearing zero six eight. Sonar is minus two one. We're ATF on comp one. Contra, all classification warship. What's up? Yeah, man, I just picked up a contact here at two zero, a hostile uh, warship, surface warship bearing uh, zero five six, sir. Well, man battle stations. Man battle stations, I sir. Chief of the watch over the one MC, man battle stations. Man battle stations. This is an all hands drill. The Rickover is going to sneak up on a hostile surface ship and sink her. This is the captain, I have the con. Lieutenant Commander Haney retains the deck. So we've got a uh, hostile surface warship bearing about 056. Aye, sir. 056. Diving officer, make it up 150 feet. 150 feet, aye, sir. This kind of warfare is unlike anything else. This ship is on its own. There are no distant commanders to check with, no other outfits guarding their flight. These men are alone and unsupported. Attention, fire control tracking party. We've got a hostile surface warship, designated Sierra 2-0, now Master 2-0, bearing 056. Who but a very enterprising, independent guy, irreverent in a military sense, is going to go want to run around in a place where he has no prospect of assistance. No prospect, no prospect of assistance. And that's just not just one once in a while, that is his whole reason for being, is to be able to do that. Now, it takes a particularly independent kind of guy. Officer Dyke passing 150 to the right center of East Motor Course. Very well. Up scope. Up Most of the activity here, here is cerebral. Submarine warfare is a mind game, with many independent minds attempting to merge into one. Head two-thirds. Scope's breaking. Next thing. Scope's clear. No course contact. Now let's go. I hold one visual contact. Only the captain is in a position to piece together all the suggestions and information his crew can provide. He's the one who must picture the entire battlefield in his mind's eye. Mass height, maybe a little higher. Yes, sir. Based on classification, use a 120 foot mass height, recompute the range. The crew has to have absolute confidence that this one guy who is who's engaged in acts that they really can't divine, they have to have absolute confidence in that guy, and they want to. They really want to believe that that skipper is the best there is. Down scope. Down scope, Range, 0.85 divisions in high. Range, 11,000, 11,000 yards. Check. Angle on the bow, port 2-0. Check. Firing point procedures. Master 2-0, tube 3. Firing point procedures. Master 2-0, tube 3. Solution ready. Weapons ready. Final bearing and shoot. Master 2-0. Bearing 0 0 0.45. Speed 5.0. Up scope. <laughs> Bearing, mark. Zero four eight point one. Down scope. Down scope. Standby. Shoot. Fire. Torpedo course. Zero three eight four. No matter how good your technology is, how wonderful these weapons are, how tough your hull is, at the end of the day, it is the man, the person, who wins or loses the battle. Can't recommend a left four zero degree steer to the weapon now. And in two world wars, your navy, my navy. We found that men and morale counted far more than material and machinery. Contire light explosion to the northeast, rough bearing 047. Sonar con I. Diving officer make it up 400 feet. And two thirds. Good job, fire control dragon party. The character of the modern submariner is shaped as much by his history as by this complex environment. And while bravery and valor are part of this history, there is also a dark side, evident from the start, a time when both the man and his machine were considered immoral. First of all, it, it was underwater, underhand, and damned un-English. That's what they said in Parliament about it, so that's a pretty good indication of what the public thought. Underhand, because you couldn't, you were hitting below the belt. 
Uh, you know, you were coming, you, you, you were supposed in those days to declare war, sail your fleets together, open fire, and you'd pound each other to bits, but it wasn't that guy suddenly. And suddenly these German U-boats uh, came along and started sinking things. And that was first evidence merely a month after World War I broke out in 1914 by the German U-9, a pathetic little submarine really, driven by a paraffin engine who came out of, uh, of harbour and found three British cruisers, the Abukir, the Cressy and the Home, patrolling in stately fashion, perfect station keeping, of course, and looking very smart. As one of those German U-boat, he sank those three British cruisers with a greater loss of life than that suffered by Admiral Lord Nelson's entire fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar uh, a century before. But the plain fact is it brought to the Admiralty's mind the first thing that the submarine was a real threat. No longer were they our waters, or your waters, or German waters. They were nobody's particular waters so long as a submarine might be underneath those waters. <laughs> During the course of two world wars, submarines turned ocean into no man's land. Nowhere was their impact more evident than in the Pacific War. American submariners, only 2% of the U.S. Navy's total forces, sank one half of Japan's merchant shipping fleet and a third of the Imperial Navy's warships. But for their efforts, the submariners paid a heavy price. Well, after you made an attack, every time they would come down the torpedo wakes and you get depth charge. And a depth charge is a very unpleasant experience. So then you would surface and make another end round. There was never any hesitancy at all on going in again. And the crew was all for it, knowing they're going to get depth charge. But it's the old, it's the old business of, of uh, well, General MacArthur said, uh, duty, honor before, for, I don't know what it was, but anyway, <laughs> you do your duty in spite of the fact, and anybody who didn't get scared of the depth charge attack was a damn fool. A lot of people took... Uh, kept a diary. I didn't keep a diary and I didn't take any pictures because I, I really didn't expect to survive the war. I mean, we had, we knew that uh, one out of five patrols, people were lost. I mean, th that was your life expectancy. When you get after five patrols, why well, you fi figure your uh, number's about ready to come up, you know? Anti-submarine forces took full advantage of the submarine's vulnerability. Submarines, after all, were merely surface ships that could submerge for only a few hours. Their underwater speed was little more than a crawl. As a result, the submarine navy lost a higher percentage of its men than any other branch of service. By war's end, naval tacticians knew that submarine performance had to be improved. Instead, it was revolutionized. <laughs> Born alongside a conventional type, the Adam submarine Nautilus displays her size as the Navy takes the wraps off its prized possession for newsreel cameramen. And here are the intricate controls that guide the huge craft like a baby carriage. These pictures were made during a cruise from the Nautilus home port of Groton, Connecticut to New York. Already the Nautilus has traveled 21,000 miles since commissioning, most of it submerged. Although the Nautilus... The Nautilus was a fabulous development. It was a true submarine that could proceed at high speed for great distances, where submarines before were only ships, surface ships, that could submerge, be uh, hard to detect then, but and operate for short distances. We had a ship that it was immediately better than anything for combat purposes. A completely new era in sea warfare opens. This ship, with its global range and ultimate stealth, 
was a weapon ideally suited for the emerging strategies of Cold War defense. Remarkably, the revolutionary power plant was conceived, designed, and made operational without incident in less than eight years. We really had support. If we needed some technical information done, if you phoned, there was somebody to talk to at four in the morning, a truck would roll or a plane would fly to get you apart or anything you needed. That was a hard driving, take a chance, get it done outfit. And why was it that way? It was all on account of that man Rickover. Hyman G. Rickover, one of the most enigmatic and powerful leaders in U.S. military history. He not only mastered the complexities of putting nuclear power on submarines, but he also mastered the complexities of the federal bureaucracy, which would fund his vision. At the height of his power, Rickover made every decision there was to make about the developing nuclear program. From the design of the reactor to the makeup of the men who would operate and command his ships. His point-blank personality is legendary. I think you want this down somewhere. <laughs> Should I start in all over again? <laughs> Thank you. The project will be under the direction of the AEC Reactor Development Division, and my boss, Dr. Lawrence Hafstad, has assigned the immediate responsibility to me. The Admiral had total control over the officers in the program, and I'm not sure he didn't keep a close eye on the enlisted people as well. What it was was a, a grilling in which he attempted to elicit some of your personal characteristics. What kind of books do you read? How many have you read in the last year? What do you do in your spare time? And why do you have spare time? Why aren't you working all the time? Uh, he made it as really as uncomfortable for the interviewee as he possibly could. The trouble with you is you want easy answers, but you don't know the proper questions. Perhaps the question should be, what should be the role of educated or intellectual people in the United States? Now, does that sound like a better question? You can pick any letter of the alphabet and put down an adjective, and it'll apply to Rickover. It'll be arrogant, belligerent, contentious, all the way Z to zealot, whatever you want. It'll apply. Yeah, let me tell you that his principal legacy in my judgment, was to reinforce many of the fundamental instincts that have served submarine force well all along. The sense of personal responsibility that's a critical part of being a submarine skipper, that business of a personal responsibility which cannot be shared, cannot be shared, is part of his legacy. Why didn't you think about it at the time and start something? Well, unfortunately, the time that you started in nuclear power in 1946, I was being born. So um, I, I, I admit that I'm coming to the issue late, all right? But well, it's, you're it's the no rising generation. You have, I, I know I defer to you, but we have felt this responsibility, but there are many things that should be done that aren't done. And I said, Lou, who is this character? Tell me about him. I got a definition of Rickover then in 1948 that went like this. There's a part that's good, there's a part that's bad, and there's a part you wouldn't believe. And in my whole interaction with Rickover from 48 through 74 and later, I never heard a better definition than that. <laughs> he was a great man. This is basic enlisted submarine school, Groton, Connecticut. Here would-be submariners get their first taste of the complex world Rickover created. Hey, hey, Captain Green! Hey, hey. These young men are all volunteers who have made it through the submarine Navy's initial selection process. Uh, the main thing the Navy looks for in choosing its submariner was intelligence. They want the smartest possible people they can get because uh, the more intelligent the person, the more things he can do, and the more and the better he's going to do them. Most of these men are just a few months out of school. Actual service on a submarine is just a hazy dream. Most of them haven't seen as much of submarines as this film has shown you. All right, guys, 
Essentially what you're looking at here right now is a ship's controlled diving and diving trainer. To prepare these sailors for the intricacies of submarining, the Navy has developed an apprentice system and some elaborate simulators. What you're going to learn here today is essentially how to dive and drive your submarine. And this trainer... Petty Officer Keith Swallow has ridden the boats for 14 years. Okay, Cagle, drop on in the inboard chair. Matuzic, drop into the outboard chair. Buckle up. All right, here's where we're at. You got a 360-foot-long, multi-million-dollar submarine right in your hands. We're going to crank up a flank bell. We're going to bring her to periscope depth, and you're going to reach and maintain periscope depth. You ready to do it? Yeah. All right, take control. Whoa. I think what you're doing wrong here is you're putting too much angle on those planes. Remember, we're hauling it. We're booking through the water. Flank bell. Minimize use of the planes, and it'll be a lot easier to maintain trim angle. Don't go no more than 5 to 10 degrees, okay. either rise or dive, on the planes, and you'll find out it's easier to catch the bubble and lock it right in there. Flooding in the torpedo room. Flooding in the torpedo room. <laughs> officer of the deck, we can't maintain order depth. Recommend emergency surface. Diving officer, emergency surface is shit. Full rise, stern plane and chair water plane. <laughs> Surface, surface, surface. Okay, hang her in there. Hang her in there. Watch that trim angle. Get her down. Get her down. Give me a little bit. Of, bring her down a little bit more. All right, brace yourselves. We're going to broach. Remember, we still got flooding going on back there in that engine room. We don't know what the status is on that. This is exactly the way it's going to happen on the boat, guys. You're going to come right up. She's going to pop right out of the water and drop back in. Well, you see, guys, we're not like surface craft. We have a problem out there. We can't call in the Coast Guard to help us. We can't put life rafts into the water. Normally when a casualty occurs on a submarine, we're underwater, we're down deep. And the only thing that's going to save us in that boat is the capability of the crew. There is an element of psychological stress involved with this. First of all, because you're talking a submarine here. And uh, no matter how good I am as an instructor in describing for them uh, what's, what's going to be required of them, it's still hard for them to visualize actual duty on a submarine, okay, and um, there's that fear of the unknown. The major part of our submarine budget is going to be spent on you guys. Submarine crews, schooling, extensive training, damage control training, they're going to pump some big bucks into you guys, but it's going to pay off. One day out there in the ocean, one remote instance where a casualty goes down, with the training you've got, you might just be the guy that's going to be there when it starts. And with your training, you'll be able to jump right on that casualty. You'll be able to save your life and save your ship. All right, what you're looking at here is a damage control wet trainer. One thing I want you to notice, it's a small, confined area. I'm going to put you down here at the start of the casualty, and we're going to turn on water flooding to simulate flooding on a submarine. All right, do a good job, take your time, safety is priority one, make it happen. How you doing, Chief? All right. We all ready to go? Yep. Okay, what I'd like to start them out with is a uh, port and starboard lube oil. Let them get the initial report and sound the collision alarm off, and then we'll hit them with the ASW suction. Flooding in the engine room. Flooding in the engine room. There we go.
Pirate Submariner has only got one enemy, and that is the sea itself, pressing in inexorably at something like a quarter of a ton on every square inch of his hull or thereabouts. That is the implacable enemy. When he has a, a war enemy, the Soviets or somebody else who's firing shots at him, it's not like being a soldier in the field, afraid of being blown up on a mine or being uh, uh, killed by a rifle shot or hit by a shell. It's not like that. All his enemy is trying to do is to let the real enemy get, in, get at him, to let that sea into the hull. Now from that comes the fact that submariners have to be very much more alert and they're fighting a war every second of the day. They're fighting a war against the greatest enemy of all, the sea itself. Scene control, training time out, all stop. All right, let me get in there and yell at him. Go in there and tell him to regroup and we'll try it again. Scene, right? Uh -huh. You got a flooding casualty. Uh -huh. It's not enough that you just assign people to go fight it. You got to follow up on it. You got two guys on that plane that have been standing up there picking their damn noses for the last two and a half minutes when you got 700 gallons a minute coming into the trainer. If you see that they're not getting the job done, take them off the job and get two more guys up there. Right. You ready to start again, Chief? All right, let's stick it to them. Hit them with the flange, Chief. Flange on. I should make believers out of them. All right, now they know what flooding is. <laughs> Welcome to the submarine force, gentlemen. Uh, 600 gallons and rising. You work with each other day in and day out on these boats. You're in a very enclosed environment. And the teamwork is a big part of it. Working together, getting along together. You're going to hear arguments, and you're going to hear bickering. But in the final analysis, no one holds a grudge forever. And believe me, there's no secrets on a submarine. None. You having problems with the wife or the girlfriend, eventually it's going to go out. And guess what? The rest of the crew is going to help you solve that problem to the point where there's going to be times where you think you're serving on that submarine with all your older brothers and all your uncles. And that's the big difference between us and the surface Navy. They don't get that tight together out there in the surface fleet. On a submarine, we do. Back on board the Rickover. Now four months since leaving home port. Standing. Five one nine fathoms. Five one nine fathoms, all right. Five one nine fathoms, check. All right, that's good. Standing, check. You have a center of gravity here, and normally the center of buoyancy, which is the amount of. This is the trial period for the apprentice seaman on board. Center of gravity. Qualify as an LR. A time to determine if they're cut out for this life. Class alpha fires are combustible material. Or if they'll be accepted into it. These messages are published so that you can take a quick look and find out, uh, for instance, these lighted buoys have been changed. This is the change in Charlie Bravo. Are there a better quality of sailor in the submarine force than anywhere else? We make them that way. I personally believe uh, that. The screening process that a guy goes through to get to submarines is. Uh, is a lot different than a guy just going to a regular ship. But uh, usually we get the cream of the crop. It's These are the most experienced enlisted men on board, the chiefs. If someone wants to know what it means to be a submariner, these are the people to ask. Then once a the kid gets here and we get them on board, uh, you know, we basically show them that, hey, we are the best, and then they kind of live up to the reputation. Or they wash out, which does happen. Even though they're here, they, most of the times the guys don't make it past the first year, they're gone. Harry Honaker, a veteran of 27 years in submarines, is the highest-ranking enlisted man. 
uh, chief of the boat. Request permission to relieve the outboard station at a course. For the Rickover's apprentice seaman, Harry is mentor and guide on their journey to become qualified submariners. Peer pressure is terrible for these young kids. Two, four, five, feet. You're probably only talking maybe 10% of the Navy of submarine sailors. And out of that 10% to probably come to submarine force, probably 2% of those never make it. I'll put on down there. Out in. He orders a turn. Your bubble is going to start rising on you. It's a world of its own. You can't you can't just step into it and say I'm part of it. You have to prove yourself. You have to qualify. You have to have the knowledge and a willpower. We're a little above depth, correct? Okay, bring your bubble down to a half down. Okay, Salazar, I'm going to give you depth control. Okay, you maintain a zero bubble. Zero bubble. Okay. You gotta get on course too. You gotta do two things at the same time now. You gotta watch this. You gotta watch the gyro. Why'd you choose submarines? It's the elite. It's the best. Um, you know, you hear about it. It's mysterious when you come in the Navy. You don't know anything about it. Like myself, I didn't know anything about it at all. My instructor said, "Hey, you got a lot of potential. Go submarines." And you come out here and. Uh, your counterparts in the fleet don't really understand what you do because they have uh, first classes and second classes do the job. But on the submarine, you're the guy that makes the things happen. Uh, the captain depends on you to make things happen. Uh, That's the big, big difference between us and surface ships, too, is we uh, we stay under here for weeks. No letters, no mail, nothing. No TV. No TV. <laughs> no radio broadcast, nothing. What's good about it? It's rewarding. It's good to know you're the cream of the crop. It's, it's also a close-knit group. I mean, uh, these other ships talk about being like a family. Well, we really <coughs> are. I know everybody's name on this ship. And on the carriers and stuff. There's no way you can memorize 5,000 names. Uh, and here, I know everybody. Well, how about all this stuff I hear about it being secret and silent and mysterious and all that stuff? Is that just a lot of... Is that a lot of hokum, or is that true? And if it is, why? We can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, we told you that. We, we can tell you that, but then we have to tell you. <laughs> no, it's That's definitely it. secret. Yeah. Definitely a lot of secrets down here. We couldn't afford to give up secrets. What we do out here, you know, very few of our uh, family members know. Uh, they get to come down and see the ship, but uh, you know, they don't really understand it, and we can't show them a lot. But uh, they see what's going on, and they still have no idea what you do once you leave. And basically, you're going to leave and uh, you're going to show back up. They have a rough idea of when, but... I can tell my wife where I'm going and when she can expect a phone call or a letter from me. My wife, she gets phone calls from my parents and everything else, and she won't even tell them over the phone. They don't understand. Well, you guys seem to get along so well. Is that, is that part of what makes this thing work? No, this is for the film. <laughs> That's the only thing that makes it work. Smoke coming out of the gallon. Fire in the gallon, fire in the gallon. Fire in the piece of fire. Fire in the gallon, fire in the gallon. Fire in the gallon. Another unannounced all hands drill. This time, a mock fire in the galley. But only a handful of men know that this is a drill. Fire is one of the most terrifying of potential casualties on a submarine. If the flames don't get you, the toxic fumes will. Fresh ride. Pack, I'm in charge of the crew, Matt. Pressure on the middle of the fire hose. Come on, let's work that hose in there. Up in control, the captain is facing critical questions while bringing the ship to the surface for air. What are the chances of collision with a surface ship? Can he surface the ship in these waters? Does he have a choice? Okay, on your deck, uh, come up to uh, 5 feet. Captain, this is XO. There's heavy smoke in the port compartment middle level. The fire is out. Reflex watch the station with a man with pressurized fire hose. 
We had to use the range guard system and two pressurized fire hoses to extinguish the fire. There are no injured personnel. Damage appears to be limited to the deep track fire thermostat. You have the same reports. The smoke is clear from the area. Also, atmosphere is a normal light via cam, sir. Very well. Uh, all hands will be ABs. The smoke has cleared throughout the ship. Atmospheres are normal. All hands remove EABs. Mr. Captain, it took us five minutes to put out that fire. That's entirely too long. As you know, the fire is the worst casualty we can have. We need to work on that one. We intend to uh, do that one uh, later today. Be ready. I expect this kind of fire to be out in two or three minutes. Carry on. Officer Deck, that's 055 to left 10 minutes more course. Very well, Officer Deck. Officer Deck. Secure ventilating. Signing officer, secure ventilating. Secure ventilating. All right, Chief of the Watson, 1MC, secure ventilating. Everybody on this ship is a volunteer. Everybody. With very hard jobs to do. And these guys work 18 hour days, seven days a week at sea but they volunteered for it, and they stay with it. Very few guys drop out of submarines. But why? Why do these men keep coming back to the danger, the confinement, the isolation? I think it was the excitement that probably drew most of us to the submarine force. And the mystique. Mystique. Yeah, that's good. The excitement. Definitely. But we found a lot of things. A lot of, most of us found what we was missing a long, a long time ago. The family, the feeling being needed and wanted. I remember at one time in Cruz Mess, he was asking people, you know, did you come from a divorce, you know, your parents divorced, you come from a broken home? And he's like, right, about seven to eight out of ten. So they're seeking something that they've never had before or had and lost and went back. For the duration of the submarine's six month plus patrol, it's virtually impossible for the crew to communicate with their families. Submarines rarely send messages out because radio signals are an easy clue to detection. The only tidbits of news the crew ever receives from home are intermittent radio messages called family grams. James like congratulate me and get my dolphin. She says she's glad to see that I'm not pond scum anymore. <laughs> and the cat's got fleas. You only get 36 words. Yeah, mad kitty do the bad. And you leave out the ads and the does, and you have to piece these things together. They're kind of, uh, it's like a little code that everybody always has worked out. You, you sit there and you read them and you say, well, what does she really mean when she says this? And a squadron will screen anything out of it. So you don't have to get a family gram with one whole sentence missing out of it. And it doesn't make no sense half the time. Most of the guys, all they want to know is, is everything okay? That's all they really care about. Miss you, sending you Christian's Easter picture. Hope everything on Rickover is good and your spirits are high. We'll start planting shrubs, grass, and backyard soon. Got job, Kmart. Like it. Got the tax papers. Miss you. Mike said hi. I'm doing fine. Don't worry. That's basically what you want to hear. You want to hear those things. Says, click. My man, my mind is still good for another three or four weeks, and uh, it just keeps our, it keeps us going. It's something that keeps us going and and tells us, hey. Everybody's fine home. We can keep doing our job. Love you, miss you, Terry. Hard work brings best of rewards. Best of luck from Proud Dad. Let's go. Let's go. Hugs, kisses, love you bunches, Laura. How old is Kristen now? Eight months old. So she's doubled in age since yeah. you left. That's amazing. Well, only a couple months to go.
lot easier. Walking into control. He was looking all around and he said, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> he said, Man, you know, I gotta stand another watch. But I got those blues because we've been gone so long. He's got those S's and blues. <laughs> on film or not, but uh, a submariner, in my opinion, is a, a person that is insensitive, hardcore, uh, strong will, strong mind, and you'll find that the longer you stay in a submarine force, you become even harder. It becomes a like a shell on you. Things, a lot of people can't penetrate your little world. Uh, in particular, in my case, I find that it is, my shell is very hard. I don't let people penetrate my world because I don't want nobody penetrating my world. Every time you talk to somebody, you sit down, you start talking to some stranger, and you're always worried, always worried that he's going to be asking you the wrong questions and you can't say nothing. And when are you going to see? Oh, next month. When you be back? Oh, a few months later. So you have to keep everything to yourself always. It's, everything's always locked up. So, and it has a tendency to build and, and continue to grow within you. And it, it just builds that little shell around you. So you have to, I don't know, it's a person that, it takes a person that can withstand holding things in a lot. So you, you always have a lot of secrets and a lot of things you talk about to, to, within each other, but you can't just, can't talk to other people about it. because you can talk to them okay on the ship but you can't talk to anybody else that's a cheap all stop for you you're not as old as the cop well, you know, that other guy well, we were talking about going home I ended up wow look at that thing oh yeehaw so we clean main seawater strainers huh? <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if those are fit i don't know if these are big around. enough I'd hate to see the body on one of those things in a dark alley. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you big, big truck. I give up on the tar. We're going to start fighting right. back here. <laughs> All this and we get to be together. Isn't this great? Gee, I don't know if we want to go home now. All right. What's your expected bearing rate? Uh, I expect you about a right point six. All right. You got enough data for the curve? I'm ready. Let's go. Something has caught the sonar team's attention. I'll take a look at Sierra 5. Had about a pretty high left bearing rate on the last turn. Probably about 4,100 yards. This bearing contact could be another submarine. And in the underwater arena, the most formidable adversary for one submarine is another submarine. Yeah, I'm also next, sir. I've got a uh, new contact, Sierra 5. Unlike a confrontation with a surface ship, when it's sub versus sub, it's hard to know who's the hunter and who's the hunted. Okay, now, Sir Dick, where you go? Yeah, good Sierra 5 here, bearing 212. Uh, fire control believes he's at about 4,000 yards. Okay, let's see where we are. Actually confirming the presence of another submarine is a long, complicated process of matching indicators with hunches about what might be happening outside the hull. Well, you got plenty of room. Why don't you maneuver and get another leg on it? 210.3. What do you got? Uh, sir, 
Sierra 5 Bear is about 210, range 30,000 yards. So you got two ranges here, huh? Uh, yes, sir, Captain. How many legs? Uh, this is the fourth leg run now. Out. Okay, you'll be able to get another range now. Yes, sir. It looks pretty good. Yes, sir, I concur with the fire control solution. Good. Well, what do you think? The last second range was uh, time 1852, 42,000 yards. I think it's going to be a pretty good range. Got a lot of change of barrier across the line of sight. We'll come back around on it. I think he's that far away, huh? I think he is. Yeah. Okay. I'm driving too much. You've right. got maybe on any one day throughout the world, what should we say, 200, maybe 300 submarines going about their business. Now, it's a very terrible thing to say because uh, this is a deadly serious business. And believe me, it is deadly serious, or it could be. But in fact, it, it's a whole lot of fun. One contact of interest right now is an unknown surface contact, Sierra 5. Well, first of all, it's a mathematical problem and a computer problem, and it's a lot of fun picking up little fragments of information, trying to put them together to determine what the other guy's doing. Is he really a submarine, or is he something else? Perhaps I'm making a mistake. Or could there be two guys out there? We haven't heard him for some time. Is that him making a noise over there again, or... Is it some other guys coming? This is a fascinating problem of, of, of blind man's puppet. And, and hell, it's fun. It, it is fun. Looks like you may have came to a course about 051. Come war, well, it wouldn't be quite so much fun because the first thing you might know about it might be a very loud bang. Concern again, new contact, ATF Comp 1, best bearings 202. Concern we're receiving hull pocket from the contact, classified submerged hostile by nature sound. Very well, man battle station. Keep a watch on the one MC man battle station. Man battle station. Man battle station. This kind of potential battle, this silent war in an unseen world, is unique to our age. With it comes an unparalleled kind of tension. Today, I think the tension is going to be even greater on the skipper. Yeah, yeah. We had, I think, great. I had great confidence that we were going to survive to get out back in the service. And now he's not going to know when weapons are coming at him. We generally knew we could hear the screws overhead. You're going to have long-range weapons fired at you. You have homing weapons fired at you. And you're going to be dependent upon your men reading instruments properly. It, it's not like you're focusing on a thing you can see. That you more scientific. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, much it's, more scientific. Right. So science, mm -hmm. it's a science. I hate to use the term Star Wars, but it's an undersea Star Wars environment and atmosphere. Really it? could be, you know, that you're already killed and you just haven't found it out yet. That weapon is going and you're not going to be able to get away from it. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that you're facing with that all the time now. You know, so it's a different thing. As far as reclassifying him as a uh, submerged submarine, right, 337? 337. As outsiders looking in, it's hard to shake the feeling that this is such an unnatural world for a man to be in. The question of why these men willingly go into such a dangerous environment is still puzzling. Certainly patriotism plays a part, but is service to one's country reason enough? The men acknowledge that they find a sense of belonging here, and pride in being members of a selective and secretive fraternity. And there is a certain allure to the intellectual challenge of their undersea mind games. Still, given these reasons, most of us would not choose to be sealed up in one of these tubes. How then does one make sense of what these men do? Perhaps by simply admitting that these men are different. Something in their makeup attracts them to this life. Maybe submarining is the only life for them. Certainly once this world grabs them, it does not easily let them go. Anyone who knows a submariner, as well as anyone can ever know a submariner, will tell you that even when he retires, he never really leaves the boats. Mm -hmm.